Ranked choice voting works. It costs less than holding runoff elections. And studies show it's popular with voters and reduces negative attacks. That's why cities and states are looking to ranked choice voting to improve their elections. Would ranked choice voting help in your community? Find out more at fairvote.org. Wavo TV is filmed for a live studio audience being held against their will. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another edition of Wavo.tv. Welcome back, you know, happy to have you. Today on the show, we have Alex Segura. He is a novelist. He is a comic book writer. He has worked on stuff for DC, for Marvel, for Image, you name it. We also might have time for a musical performance by Cats with Hats. We will see how that goes. But for now, let's head on over to the George Carlin Podcast Studio and meet up with our host, Mr. BJ Mendelson. Wow, that, that's much more obnoxious than an on Riverside with a cat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Alex, thank you so much for joining me on another edition of Weibo TV. Would, would you be so kind as to introduce yourself and tell us what you're working on? Sure. Thanks for having me. Uh, I am a novelist and comic book writer. Uh, my latest novel, Secret Identity, uh, came out in March, and it's a crime novel set in 1975 New York City in the comic book industry. I've also written a ton of comic books like um, The Dusk, The Black Ghost, The Awakened, The Archies. I've done stuff for Marvel and Dark Horse and Image and a bunch of places. And I've also written podcasts like the first season of Lethal Lit. And yeah, I think that's the the top line. I, I wrote a PI series set in Miami, my hometown, the Pete Fernandez mysteries that you know people seem to like. So yeah, I'm one of them. Uh, oh, thanks. <laughs> that, I appreciate that, that. That's how I first came across you. Was, yeah. was through the, um, there's so many different things to, to ask you about, but let me let's talk real quick about Zest World and mm. the book that you have on there. Could you could you explain just for people that might not know what Zest World is, what that is? Sure. So Zest World is a platform um, that partners with creators. And what happens is you you basically you, you, you run a newsletter of sorts. You send newsletters to your subscribers and there's different tiers. There's like a free newsletter where you can kind of find out about what I'm working on and, and what, what things my collaborators are working on, but also uh, a paid tier where you get you get the new pages of the comic delivered to you in chapter form. So uh, what we're doing now is you get a monthly chunk of about eight to 10 pages. And by the end of it, you've read the whole series of the awakened, which is a superhero murder mystery. But, um, they also have a lot of other amazing creators on their platform, like Jimmy Palmiotti and Amanda Connor, Phil Jimenez, Joel Jones, um, Josh Adams, I'm sure I'm forgetting uh, Pete Tomasi. And, um, so it's a great place for fans to just sign up and kind of shop around for comics they like. And it's also a great platform, I think for creators that are looking for a hub to, you know, if you've launched a Kickstarter and fulfilled it, but you've got all this content and you want to start feeding it out to people, it's a good, good spot for that too. Yeah, I think it's something that's sorely needed for creators to just to have a space that they own and control that that's not subject to like an algorithm, you know, suddenly. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think, you know, they give you the tools to kind of promote it, obviously, on social media, but you've got this one place that you can send people to and you can create almost like an, a hub for your content, which is really neat. What, have you noticed? Well, let me let me rephrase it another way. Like, what what's the difference between writing for something like Zest World versus writing for Archie? Like, is there a way that you mm -hmm. have to structure and change the comment, the comments because of the format? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I think what we, what I do with my co-writer, Mike Moracy, Michael Moracy is that, you know, we write always knowing that hopefully the intent is to have it in print and exist as a comic book in shops and bookstores, but we also need to make the online experience compelling. So when we break out the quote unquote chapters, we try to make it, a scene, you know, a moment that a, a reader feels like they're getting their money's worth. I mean, to subscribe, it's five bucks a month, which is like what you would spend probably on a latte on your way to work one, right. you know, daily. So, uh, you know, and, and I think what we try to do is make the, the chunks of pages they get meaningful, like a scene or two or a moment, you know, it's half an issue in print. So hopefully the reader feels like, okay, I'm getting something of note and I'm engaged and compelled to like keep reading and keep paying. I, I really like that format too, because it, it's sort of like how they used to release Sherlock Holmes, but yeah, they have now now done for a comic book, which is very cool. And, and yeah. so, uh, so tell us a little bit about the story that that you're doing. It's superhero murder mystery is is a lot of fun. I, I noticed a recurring theme here of crime yeah. and <laughs> investigative yeah. reporting. It's all right. work, but. So um, The Awakened conceptually is like, yeah, superhero murder mystery, kind of in the same vein as other series like The Golden Age, which was an exploration of World War II DC superheroes which are, with a much more realistic bent, or Black Hammer, which is Jeff Lemire's fantastic like widescreen like superhero 
epic or Astro City, which is like, you know, Kurt Busaic and and uh, Brent Anderson doing very people focused and character driven narratives in this bigger superhero world. So it follows this team called the Freedom Alliance, which is akin to Marvel's Avengers or DC's Justice League. And we're seeing them at a very critical juncture. We're kind of seeing them at a breaking point where the patriotic hero Paragon is wondering where he went wrong. You know, what happened to the heroes of before that were just altruistic and there to help and now have been replaced by more, you know, commercialized and I guess profit driven heroes. And he's kind of having a soul searching moment at the same time we are introduced to his number two, um, Lana Cortez, who is not a superhero. She's quote unquote, a regular person, but she's kind of the, the engine that keeps the Freedom Alliance running because it's a funded government super team. Um, and without spoiling too much, a death happens. There's a murder in the opening issue, opening pages. You'll, you'll find out as you read the story. And Lana has to take on a more active role to figure out who killed um, her teammate, one of her teammates, and what happens when they try to pin it on her. So she has to make some difficult choices and kind of see the wider world outside of the Freedom Alliance. And so it owes a lot to stuff like the Parallax View and 70s conspiracy movies, but also is a love letter to superhero team comics like Squadron Supreme, a little bit of Watchmen, though everyone nods to Watchmen. But, you know, like the idea of there being some kind of bubbling tension underneath this you know, shiny veneer of superheroes. Yeah, it, it also reminds me a little bit of Kingdom Come. Yeah, yeah, I think well. there's a little bit there without being too uh, pretentious. But, you know, like, no, I'm not saying Kingdom Come is pretentious. <laughs> sure. but I mean, us being pretentious by yes. comparing ourselves. I'll let well, you make I, that comparison. I, I think, well, I mean, anytime you deal with that, you know, the new hero versus the mm. old style, traditional, what we would think of a superhero, or at least the baby boomer image of yeah. a superhero uh, is always deeply fascinating to me. So I like what what kind of spurred that uh, that take. Yeah, you know what? I, I was reading a lot of team books. You know, I was never an Avengers kid. I, I started to get into the Avengers uh, as an adult, and I was reading a lot of Avengers, like Roger Stern's run, and things like Supreme Power, JMS, J. Michael Straczynski's, and Gary Frank's really, really kind of deconstruction of the Justice League type, te type team. And I found it really fascinating. And I thought this is a great setting for just a traditional murder mystery, but also as an exploration of what heroism is. And, you know, heroism isn't necessarily having power because all these characters have power uh and what it means to to be a hero when everyone else is just super powered and not necessarily a hero by definition so it's a, an exploration of heroism in a nutshell yeah and it's very timely too i hope so yeah yeah we're you know we're dealing with that now like just because you're in alpha and in power doesn't mean you're a quote-unquote good person exactly exactly right uh now i noticed that there's some similarities between th this story and secret identity so mm -hmm. I, I like i'm curious is there when you approach any new story are there just certain archetypes that you like to play with and what attracts you to them you know i was i'm not a theme writer which is to say i don't enter a project and think this is the theme i'm going to explore it usually i notice it as i look back and i think the themes that i touch on in all my work whether it's like the pete fernandez novel secret identity or the awakened or even something like the dusk it's about you know overcoming your problems to find your true self and kind of reach your true being you know kind of potential and um with the awakened we see lana is kind of our viewpoint character and see her basically overcome her inhibitions and fears to become the hero that I think she was always going to be. And for something like the black ghost, which is another superhero book I've co-written, but also kind of steeped in noir. It's about someone overcoming their personal demons and problems and addictions to live up to a legacy. They didn't really even know was theirs. Um, and so, yeah, it's a lot of just fulfilling potential, but overcoming your demons to do that. Is there, what, what, what sort of drives that? Like what is, what is it that sort of attracts you to that message? I think it's something we all deal with internally, like struggle with personally. Like you always want to maximize your time on this earth, like for however long you're here and, and do the best you can. And also not leave anything on the cutting room floor. Like I, I'm always, I'm, I've had the blessing of being able to turn my hobbies into my career, like as a writer, or like to call that my job is really amazing. And so I try to maximize my time. So people are like, when do you, when do you have free time? Like when do you relax? And I'm like, I play with my kids and I sometimes will watch an episode of a TV show, like maybe once a week, but most of the time I'm, what I do for work is pretty fun. So it's kind of, that's the fun of it. Like I don't, I, I really like, I work hard because I like to do it. And I think that's, I'm lucky to be able to do that. And I think that's part of 
what I touch on in my work is having these characters that are really driven or ch discover that they can be driven if they kind of overcome these things that are challenging them. Hey, it's me, God. I know it's been a while and I haven't been the best dad, especially this century. Well, I was going through some shit and you know what? I'm not going to talk about it. All you need to know is that I'm doing commercials now. I've got bills to pay too. Do you have any idea how much I just lost on crypto? A lot. A lot. And so now God needs your money. Like for real this time. Not like all those other times every Sunday. You know who else needs your money? B.J. Mendelson. So give them $5 by visiting buymeacoffee.com slash B.J. Mendelssohn. That website again is buymeacoffee.com slash B.J. Mendelssohn. Buymeacoffee.com slash B.J. Mendelssohn. And if you don't give B.J. your money, you and I are going to have problems. Big ones. Hey there, boys and girls. It's your old podcast pal, Ralph Garman here, inviting you to invite me into your ear holes five days a week with my podcast, The Ralph Report. Join me, Eddie Pence, Steve Ashton, and the rest of the happy lunatics that make up the Garmy for as little as 15 cents a day. And for that, you get five shows a week filled with music and jokes and news and history and just so much good stuff that you're going to be glad you chose The Ralph Report. How do you listen? Well, it's pretty simple. Go to patreon.com, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash The Ralph Report and sign up today. There's four amazing levels of subscription that you can join, each one with their own special bunch of benefits. So check it out. Listen to me, Ralph Garman, on The Ralph Report. Patreon.com slash The Ralph Report. Well, tell, tell us a bit about Secret Identity, because um, when, sure. when I read it, it Reminded me so much of a book that I love, uh, The Adventures of Cavalier and Clay. Oh, thank you. Uh, and I, I love that it was, there's definitely like a similar world to it. And so I would love to hear just how that project got started for you. Yeah, you know, um, thank you for the comparison. Like Cavalier and Clay is one of my favorite novels. And um, it's one of these ideas that per has been percolating in my mind for almost 20 years. Like I, I remember being in college, being on the bus between campuses, reading Cavalier and Clay and reading Chabin's first two novels, um, Mysteries of Pittsburgh and Wonder Boys, which are all, all fantastic. And, you know, I'm reading Cavalier and Clay and I'm loving it. I'm like, wow, he wrote a book for me. Like it's a novel about the golden age of comics. And the only thing I felt like was missing, and it's not a criticism, is that I couldn't read the escapist comics. You know, you're reading about the escapist, you're in this world. Um, and I know Dark Horse eventually did it, but that stuck with me. Like how cool it would it have been if as you're reading about Cavalier and Clay, you then see pages of the escapist. And then I kind of filed it away, never thinking like I'll do it myself. Um, but then fast forward a few years and I'm working at a newspaper in Miami, still not a published writer, but starting to be one, starting to think about doing that. And I created this character called the links, like just a rough idea. Like the name was there. Um, it never happened materialized. And so I filed that away and then fast forward to, I want to say 2018 or 2019 and I'm finishing up the Pete Fernandez novels. I'm working on Poe Dameron, which was a star Wars novel I wrote. And I'm thinking, what's my next crime novel going to be? And, um, I've always been fascinated by crime writers that transport you to another world, but still manage to tell you a noir story. So someone like Megan Abbott, who she'll write a story about cheerleading and it's compelling, it's dark, it's well-crafted and it's a, it hits all the noir tropes and inverts them in a smart way, but it's cheerleading. And so you're, I, I was fascinated that she could pull me into this world and like, I was hooked immediately and I thought, wouldn't that be great to do with comics? And I had never read a comic book noir, though I'm sure there are murder mysteries set in comics, but, and then it all kind of came back to me, the links as a character, as a comic character, but also the idea of interspersing comic book pages. And so all that stuff was kind of floating in the ether, but it doesn't matter if you don't have a character. And, um, you know, then Carmen walked into my brain and that, that to me, I'd never, I had only experienced that with Pete before you know in terms of like a character just showing up and saying hello here i am like tell my story and she showed up and she was so much the polar opposite of pete she was 
driven, put together, focused, smart, but also had a, you know, an in, you know, she was, she was not just a hard ass. She was also had this sensitivity that I found really relatable. Like she was, she was flawed, but also she doesn't let people in as easily as someone like Pete does. And so, you know, when she showed up, I knew that was a linchpin. And then the idea of doing it in 1975, an era where, you know, there wasn't a comic book movie for every character and there wasn't, um, a TV show for every character. There wasn't this idea of media like comics weren't even, there weren't comic shops yet per se. There were, they were on the newsstand. The industry was failing. So I wanted to present a very different comic book world than we know today. Like, you know, it's, you know, people didn't write comics in the hopes of making it a TV show in the same way that people didn't really write books in the hopes of it becoming a show or a movie. Like now that's a new thing in not relatively new thing. Um, and so I wanted to really have readers who are familiar with the world of comics and entertainment today reading this New York comic book novel showcasing a very different industry and a very different New York. And that was really fun. And then having Sandy Gerald do those comic book sequences was amazing. Yeah, it looks beautiful. Like it's it looks beautiful. And I like the I, it's almost like a brain break almost yeah. that makes sense oh, like, yeah like, yeah like you're reading and you're like oh okay now i could switch to comic mode and then i could switch back to and it just seems to like give you a moment to breathe which i was really fascinated by like was that uh what was the thought behind putting the panels within the book like as you were as it was being designed for, for you know release? that's a, yeah that's a great question because my big my one worry was i really need this to count i can't have the comic sequences just feel like okay alex is showing off he knows an artist he threw in some comic pages and it's just like dressing i wanted it to really feel like an integral part of the narrative so you're reading the prose and you're left on kind of a cliffhanger and then suddenly you have this gear shift where you have to now read it as a comic but i wanted the content in the comic to complement what you had just experienced in the prose so you read that prologue where you kind of meet carmen as a kid and you see the troubling the troubled stuff with her parents and how she's always wanted to hide and tell this, you know, you know, be a storyteller. And then the next sequence is the Lynx jumping from a rooftop and, and doing her thing. Um, and then you're introduced to Carmen as an adult. And so it was a really thoughtful process. I had a pretty detailed outline. And so with Sandy, I, I, I kind of carved out where the sequences would fall. So he had a sense, he read the novel as it was happening and was able to kind of play off that in a really fun way. And so it all feels cohesive is my point. Like it, it feels like one thing that just happens to shift mediums. Was there were there any characters from real life comics that that found? I, I mean, I know the answer, but I'm not, I'm not like asking yeah, this yeah, for, yeah. for for people who might not uh, have read the book yet. Like, are, are there people from the comics industry that you found making their way into Secret Identity in one way, shape, or form? Yeah, that's a great question. Definitely. And one of the one of the questions I dealt with early on with Zach Wagman, my editor, was do we want this to be in the real world, quote unquote, and and really strive for a sense of verisimilitude, i.e., like now I'm talking I'm talking like an email, like basically saying, like, do we want this to feel like something that could have happened, or do we want to just kind of pull it out and make it its own universe where there is no Marvel, there's no DC, there's no uh no historical uh, backdrop and i really wanted it to feel like it counted you know i wanted it to feel like the link if you squint and and read it you could feel like the links existed and you could kind of visualize like finding a copy of the links in a long box somewhere in a, in a comic shop so yeah there are real characters but obviously you know when you're dealing with real people you have to kind of tread carefully you can't can't show them doing something that they didn't do by historical fact like i can't have like jack kirby uh you know, punch a character, you know, like, cause that was not a recorded thing that he did. I could say, you know, Carmen goes to a convention and Jack Kirby is there because based on my research, he was there or, you know, Len Wein is mentioned cause he was at that convention that's in the book. And, and then there's one moment where I think Jeffrey Carlisle, who's like the EIC of triumph, which is where Carmen works. He references a poker game he went to with, and he rattles off some creators. And those actually happen. Those like Jim Shooter, Paul Levitz, and, and Marv Wolfman poker games happen. So you could or, you know, plausibly say that the head of Triumph maybe played in one of those games at one point. You know, like it's all, it's right. all like as long as you're kind of dancing between the raindrops, but I feel like that texture added so much to it that you felt like you were really there as opposed to being like Don Smith, the head of xo comics you know like instead of changing it to just avoid that i really wanted to lean into the meta part of it right you know it reminds me of i mean so many different people have said this but like it, there's universality in being specific mm -hmm. and yeah and that, that's why i felt like I, the specificity is 
for anyone who's familiar with the comics industry, I think allows them to just jump into the bug. Yeah, no, I think there, it, it really gives you like anchors. There's a moment where Carmen is talking to one of the senior editors early in the book, and they just go on a little tangent talking about their love for like Denny O'Neill and Neil Adams is Batman. And that to me, like that was the one kind of fanboy moment I allowed myself because the rest of the time they are talking. It's almost like I, like the wire where you're, you kind of have to pay attention because they're talking about these things in the way that normal people talk as opposed to like having Wikipedia asides where it's like Jim Starlin, who was born in blah, 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 and penciled <laughs> Captain Marvel and Warlock, you know, like, um, and I wanted it to feel rooted in that without too much like exposition, I guess. This is Rosie Tran from Rosie and BJ Save the World, a podcast asking big questions and discussing how to solve these big issues. This is a podcast for people just like you who ask, has the war on drugs been successful? Do we need universal basic income? Should we legalize sex work? Go to rosieandbjsavetheworld.com to get more confused. Commercials suck, and hopefully one day we won't need them. But until that day comes, we have bills to pay, brother. This copy. I, I don't know, man. BJ wrote it, and I think he was high when he did it. How do you know he was high? I just I read through it, and I just have a. I don't know, man. Just read it. <laughs> what kind of bills do we have to pay? Well, for starters, you wouldn't believe how much it costs to feed a super intelligent ape who wants to kill Superman. Yes. At first, he said he would pay BJ rent, but then some asshole told the ape about squatters', squatters rights. rights. Yep. He's a super villain, you know, so he stopped paying rent. Now we all kind of work for him. He's a terrible boss. One time he was eating some guy's face and just left the rest of him in the middle of the floor. I guess it's better than working at Amazon, though. Anyway, the apes got this cool ass setup in the basement of BJ's mom's house. You should see it. There's this kick ass pool down there. I have no idea how you get a huge pool in the basement of a small house, but he found a way. Separate lines, he found a way. Now, if only the ape could remember to take out the garbage in his office before he leaves for the weekend, everyone else does it. That includes Stephen Wheat, who works in accounting and shits out of his mouth. (laughs) Anyway, that's what's going on here in Harriman, New York, home home of the... Yeah, man, I'm pretty sure he was high, but let's just get back to it. (laughs) Now, let's get back to the show. Let me ask you about crime writing in general, Mm because I know it's something that the world that you play in quite a bit. Um, what is it that, that you love most about the genre? What I love, I love about crime fiction is that it brings readers to new places, to new people, to new cultures. I think it's so important to have diverse authors sharing their diverse viewpoints, because for me, I'm not a big traveler. I mean, I travel. I like to, tra- I, well, I don't want to say I like to travel. I like to be places. I don't like the transition of being elsewhere, but I love traveling through fiction. I love learning about new places, new worlds through the eyes of someone who's lived there. And I love learning about new cultures and new people and you know, new kinds of experiences. And I think crime fiction also puts a spotlight on our world and the flaws in the world in a very, in the packaging of a fun story, like an entertaining story. But at the same time, you're getting a little bit of social commentary and that feels really valuable to me. And it's, you know, I don't want to say it's, it's like having your dessert and your vegetables too, but it kind of is like, you get to learn about the world and what's wrong with the world and what may be right with the world while also enjoying this kind of fast paced adventure or noir story. And that's what I love about it. And, And I think it's, it's so great that we're seeing so many more diverse voices come in. Like, um, because for a long time, it was a very typical kind of story you got in a crime novel. And now that's changing. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I love the Bosch books, but yeah, there's, there's a million books that, that sound and read just like Bosch. So yeah, he uh, started yeah. it, but now there, there's like a legion of imitators, and so you want something different too. Exactly. Um, let me let me ask you about the PI series. Like, so mm-hmm. is this is this something you're going to continue? Like, what is what are your plans with that character? Uh, the Pete Fernandez books. Yeah. Um, I think Miami Midnight was. You know, when I sent it to my editor, I said, this is the last one. And he was like, oh, man. And then once it was announced, it's like, this is the final Pete Fernandez mystery. 
I was blown away by the response. So many people I'd never heard of that were reading the series were like, oh no, you can't do this. Like even Ian Rankin, who's like a huge bestselling author was like, have you lost your mind? <laughs> you're doing this thing and now you're going to end it. Um, so I've, I've, uh, amended my statement to say this is the last novel for now like i don't have anything new to say i have a new short story a pete fernandez short story in this collection that's coming out um later this year called um called witness and it's about people witnessing crimes and how they react in those situations but it's a prequel so it's kind of it even predates silent city which was the first one so i think at some point i'll find something compelling to say with pete uh i i did I, he suffered so much through those five <laughs> books that you know, without spoiling anything, I kind of left him in a good place, you know, um, happy for the moment. And um, I did start pecking away at his next, you know, if you read Miami Midnight, there's a scene at the end where he's like on to the next thing, but it felt like a very different series, you know, whereas the Pete books were much more character driven and about his evolution. I think if he were to e be something else, it would much be much more episodic. Sure. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's almost like the difference between Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul. Yeah, 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 totally. Yeah, I think there's room for something else. I just don't know what it is yet, and that's okay. Let me ask you about, uh, you've worked on some crazy RG books. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so let me, I, I want to make sure I get to that before we, before we wind down. Um, sure. What, do you have a favorite uh, RG crossover that, that you worked on? I love them all for different reasons. You know, Archie Kiss was my first long form comic work in terms of like more than just one single issue. I had to learn how to map out a four issue arc. I, I was, you know, I treated it kind of as this fantastical thing, like Kiss are actual demons in the story. I got to play with all the classic Archie toys like Sabrina and Josie and the Pussycats. So it was really fun for me as an Archie fan. And I love Archie Ramones because it felt like just a fun 70s or 80s movie, like time travel. Giselle's mm -hmm. art is fantastic. Um, and it just felt very compact and just like it, it felt very much in tune with the nature of the Ramones, like th these playful, like characters that just want to have fun and, and, you know, how are, you know, are a little, you know, devilish in how they behave. But then I also have a real soft spot for the Archies, the series, because that was again, my first like ongoing book, even though it ran only eight issues, like it was Matt Rosenberg and I, and Joe Eisma, the artist got the chance to really like, you know, it's a, I, I joke about this, but it's a story about failure. It's about failing as a band and how you recover from that and how friendship is much more valuable than stuff like ambition, like musical ambition. And so we got to play with artists at different er er moments in their career. Like, um, bands like churches and tegan and sarah who are not up and coming but were new newish and then retro ish bands like the monkeys and then we also got to deal with blondie but it wasn't like blondie from the 70s because we'd done the time travel it was blondie today and so they got to produce the archie's record so that was really a blast i i do miss I'm, I'm sad that we didn't get the opportunity to do some other bands that we were kind of discussing like talking heads or the ramones i'm uh, not the ramones uh the replacements which would have been a personal favorite but um you know I, I'm I'm proud of those eight issues as they are. Is there was is there any Archie crossover that you think is too far gone? Like it would never happen, but it would be amazing to see. I would have. I really wanted to do Archie meets the Beatles. I feel like that would have been amazing because I'm a Beatles obsessive in terms of history and things like that, and um, that would have been cool. And Archie Taylor Swift was something we tried really <laughs> hard to do, but you know, maybe someday. Yeah, I, you know, I think these, the reason why I want to ask you about the Archie comics is I don't think they get the credit that they do. One, for having art that yeah. is absolutely solid and consistent in every issue. And the stories are great. And so, like, I want to say thank you because, I, you know, oh, thanks. I wish more people, and it seems like every time there's a crossover, it'll get some media coverage. Mm -hmm. uh, but then that's the only time you'll hear about the comics that are coming out. Yeah, you know, they really should do like an omnibus of all the music crossovers in one, and that would that could be a one. I mean, I don't work there in terms of the publishing stuff anymore, but if if I had a suggestion, I I would send that along. <laughs> right, right. Uh, let me so just real quick, like what what was your first? So you you mentioned your first ongoing series and mm -hmm. learning how to break it down. What did you go to, to to help learn how to break and format the comic? You know, this sounds silly, but it's, I, I went back to the comics I loved and like, what, what is the pacing? And, and I, I'd read a lot of books from comic book writers suggesting advice. And one of the, one of the best bits of advice was start big, like start with a, a compelling image or a compelling moment. So your reader is pulled in immediately and, you know, don't, don't overshadow the artist. Um, I was so blessed to start out with someone like Dan Parent, who is like a pro, a pro's pro in terms of drawing Archie. So I leaned on him a lot and, um, 
you know, you don't, you don't overburden the page with your words. It's a visual medium. So let the artist tell as much of the story as you can. And that allows you to be more literary and kind of thoughtful about what you're saying. Um, I've learned over time that I really like to collaborate with artists. I don't, I don't like to dictate. I like to tell them, this is what I'm looking for. What are you going to add to it? And then it's, 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 it's like playing in a band because you're, you're jamming together and you hope that the end result is much greater than what you could have done by yourself. Absolutely. Uh, before I get to my last question, can you tell us yeah. where, to fi- where to find you, where to buy Secret Identity, where can we check out the, the superhero murder mystery, like just everything that you Yeah, have yeah. Uh, I've got a website, alexagura.com. That's kind of my one-stop spot for all those, those things. And I'm pretty active on Twitter at Alex underscore Segura. I'm really waiting for Alex at Alex Segura to like vacate his account so I can <laughs> take over. Um, but um, yeah, and I also am on Instagram at Alex Segura Jr. <laughs> My last question for you is what what is your dream comic project that that you would love to write? Oh man, I'm writing a short story in a Spider-Man anthology called Edge of Spider-Verse. It comes out August 3rd and I'm writing um this character called Aranya who is uh, a Latinx teen superhero, not a teen she's older now, but uh that was a dream just playing in the Spider-Man universe and I love character of the big two characters, you know, I love Spider-Man, I love Batman, I love the X-Men, and so, yeah, getting the chance to play in any of those worlds would be huge. Well, that's our show, and uh, our, our apologies to the band, you know, we kind of just ran out of time, that's kind of the, uh, that's the nature of things, it's the, it's the name of the game. <sighs> Hey, hey, hey! Vaped Crusaders comes out on the 20th of every month. The 20th! You can't smoke that in here! Uh, Oh, wait, what day is it now? Do I look like a fucking calendar to you? Hey, man, I don't need all the attitude and stuff, you know? I don't don't need it. Well, I don't need your face, your vape, or your... Are those Air Jordan 3 OGs? Yeah, yes. Those are $4,500 sneakers. I know, they're pretty sweet. Yeah, they are. No, wait. I don't like you. Don't make me like you. I'm not, man. I'm just out here. I'm just trying to relax, dude. I'm on to you, pal. You're trying to do some Jedi mindfuck bullshit. <laughs> and I don't I don't think that's what it's called. I don't think that's the thing. You want to play mind games with me, motherfucker? All right, let's dance. <sighs> Sorry. Um, make sure to tune in to Vape Crusaders. New episodes are going to drop every month on the 20th right here on Weibo.tv. Whew. Okay, your, your, your middle name is Macho. But uh, I'm wondering if you ever cry. You ever Has a macho man ever cried? Yeah. Really? Uh-huh. It's okay for macho men to show every emotion available right there, you know, because I've cried a thousand times. I'm going to cry some more. But... I've soared with the eagles, and I've slithered with the snakes, and I've been everywhere in between. And I'm going to tell you something right now. There's one guarantee in life, and that there are no guarantees. Yeah. And uh, mm-hmm. I understand this. <laughs> yeah. Nobody likes a quitter. Nobody said life was easy. So if you get knocked down, take the standing eight count, get back up, and fight again. Did you enjoy today's show? If you did, please take a minute and leave us a review. Yes, we know you're busy and every podcast asks you to do this, but there's a good reason they do. Because every time you leave a review, that review helps more people find and listen to the show. And you know what that means for you? More great episodes of Weiwo.tv. So what are you waiting for? Take out your phone and leave us a review right now before you move on to something else and forget about us. And we'll see you next time, right?